we were on a track for this domestic violence. A former armor army ranger, I think, had um, yeah gotten wh- whatever happened at home. It led to some bad stuff that happened that night. Um, and he ran from the apartment complex we were tracking. We tracked into this bathroom, and there was a stall on the left, and and Nico just passed right by the stall. Right. And then does a circle and comes back to the stall. And there he is as I'm passing because I'm holding the leash behind him. I look over and I see him right there. And it was one of those that because he was blind in his left eye, he totally just he, he walked right past, which could have gotten me killed, could have gotten him killed. Um, the guy was, you know, just crying in the corner and realized he had done some bad stuff. But uh, and there was no issue. But it was one of those that I realized, man, this it's not safe for this dog. It's not safe for me. Uh, probably need to go and retire this dog. Welcome to Game of Crimes. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, dudes, dudes, that's players, playerettes, amigos, amigas, whatever order you want to put that in. Thank you once again for joining us on this thing of ours we call the Game of Crimes. I am your host, uh, you know, with the most, most hair, most good looks. <laughs> Morgan, right? Here literally with my <laughs> sputtering partner in crime. The guy that puts up with all his crap. Hey, everybody, it's Murph. But you can call him Murph. There you go. That's right. Common spelling. Common spelling. Hey, well, guys, well, thank you guys once again for joining us. Uh, This will be a good episode. But before we get into talking about the episode, let's just knock out a couple things because the script says housekeeping is next. So go on over to Apple and Spotify. Hit those five stars. Uh, It really helps us out a lot. We really appreciate it. Drop in your comments. Let us know how we're doing. We do take those to heart and we work on it. Uh, also head on over to our website, gameofcrimespodcast.com for everything. We got our book list on there. When we talk about our next guest, he will have two books added to that list. We've got merch, uh, all that good stuff, our mailing list. Follow us on social media at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook, and this thing called the Instagram. But Murph, where do you got to be repeated three times? <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to shorten everything here a little bit? <clears throat> You got to be over on Patreon because we've got some content over there. In fact, we just thought, just a few minutes ago finished recording our case of the month, what we call case of the month. And it's a discussion about my last undercover working for DEA before I got promoted up into the supervisory ranks. So if you want to hear that story as, as pathetic as it might be, come on over, try us out. And, and it's his it. last real cop work before he became a pencil and paper pusher. Yeah. After that, I became a bureaucrat. A bureaucrat, but, uh, but come over, come over, and give us a listen, and, and you know what? Share it and tell your friends about us as well. Share one, tell one. It's where you got to be. Looking, we've got uh, coming out too. We've got episode four, the real DEA narcos talking about the real DEA narcos Cali edition. Um, Chris Feistel, Dave Mitchell, these guys are studs. A lot of great stuff. That will be a total of sixteen episodes. Um, but so join us over there for that. We've got coming up to, you know, 911, what's your emergency? We've got um, our narco media review of the case of the month. And then for our warden of the throne at our highest level, we've got our special intimate warden of the throne only exclusive stuff we do for them. So join us. Patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. But also head on over to PayPal.com and use our email, Game of Crimes Podcast at gmail.com or PayPal.me slash Game of Crimes. Whatever it makes it easier for you to support the show and help us bring you even more exciting content. But before we get started, our standard disclaimer this is a show about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. Murph, we take the stories seriously, but. Mm-hmm. We never, <laughs> we never take ourselves serious. We're going to have some fun on here. You got to see. You want to know what fun is? Well, listen and see what happens. Yeah, but only one episode. There was no fun of that one, and we still get comments right. back on Natasha Hertzig's episode. But, um, guys, great stuff uh, coming up. But this time, we can be funny. And so, to be funny and to get into our next section, I have to ask you, Murph, once again, do you know what time it is? It's almost like a Chicago scene. Does anybody really know what time it is? We know what time it is. What time is it, Murph? And we, re- and we really care. Yes. It's time for... Small, Small town, town police, police blotter. Blotter. At you Once again at the speed of light Through the magic of Al Gore's amazing internet Steve, 
We start off with noise complaints. Everybody loves noise complaints. Didn't you love those? You know, when you used to be a real cop in Bluefield? Yeah. I got in a fight in the street over a noise complaint one time. I hated it. Noise complaint. 7.19 p.m. Residents at the Boulders. Apparently, that's the, I don't know if this is Bedrock and, Fred, you know, Fred yeah. Flintstone and Barney. and Barney. Uh, but uh, the rebels reported a loud argument between a man and woman and banging on the walls that caused a painting in their apartment to fall to the floor. Police determined that the couple, that the neighbors were engaged in what was described as overzealous copulation and were not arguing. Why that makes it into the, you can tell it's a small town police blotter. We don't know what town it is, but anytime you put stuff like that, that's probably the most exciting thing that happened for like the entire day, if not the entire shift. So. <laughs> and not the week. <laughs> so. Well, I wonder, I wonder how the, uh, the people that got called on, I wonder how they answered the door. Naked? In a bathrobe? What are you doing? <laughs> Nothing. We're just talking. Next time, don't speak so close to the microphone. Okay. Ah, that's funny. Right. Steve, suspicious okay. activity. We love those calls too, right? Uh, Sometimes there's really some real suspicious activity. This one is suspicious yeah, yeah. simply because of the description, right? 9.13 a.m., a vehicle with three flat tires and vomit on the pavement next to the driver's door was towed from a South Amherst uh, parking lot. Uh, was the person still inside? No, but hopefully not. Not if they're towing the car. Uh, well, if they threw up on, you know, sounds like a. What? Well, how did you get the three flat tires? It sounds like a drunk drove over a that, lot of stuff, parked it, yeah. vomited. I was even thinking maybe spike strips that the cops had put out for him if they would have caught him. Dang. You know, I, I wish I could say I never it got that never... drunk that I threw up, but I'd be lying. Yeah. Now, especially if it was a singular uh, event. Uh, we know it happened multiple times. But just ask Connie. <laughs> just ask Connie. <laughs> well, hey, but Steve, you know, we just did a whole case of the month episode about a uh, big undercover deal that you did involving marijuana. Mm -hmm. So our next case involves marijuana. Woo. A man called officers to notify them that he suspected the marijuana his friend sold him was laced with something <laughs> and that he had felt crazy ever since smoking it. He wanted to see a doctor. Boy, why don't you just call the doctor? <laughs> why you got to call the cops and tell them that? <laughs> and put yourself on the radar. Yeah, okay, well, kid, maybe we should come over and test it for you. Yeah, come to the door. Oh, it's right geez. here. Uh, I'll leave it on the front porch for you. Door's open. Come on in. Oh, and Steve, I tell you, that stuff still works. These uh, Some of these folks, just for fun, they say, look, if you have any doubts, we'll come over and test it. Make sure you got the real stuff. Does it work every time? No, but it only has to work once to make it a funny story and the stuff of legend. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah, the criminals are not the smartest people out there, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, and I've run into a couple cops that they're one paycheck away from being one of those dumb criminals. So oh, yeah. you guys got to step up your game. Yeah. All right. Anyway, speaking of stepping up our game. Uh, before before we do this, though, uh, just remember, if you guys want to have a little bit of fun, too, uh, just go on over to our Game of Crimes fans page run by our yeah. favorite mafia queen, Sandy Salvato. Just hop in there because we throw out uh, some fun things that we talk about about episodes, things we only post in there that we don't even post on our main page. So this is a fan group when we have our page. So go on over there. Just search for it. Go to, go to uh, Facebook and go Game of Crimes fans. Hop in there and join, join, just jump into the deep end with us. Have fun. You can leave your clothes on if you want. Everybody else's, you know, <laughs> comes the way they are. You know, and, and uh, our last interview with Keith Cregan, the uh, Morristown, New Jersey police officer that was working on the IRS and DEA task forces, we've gotten some great comments, especially from Sandy Salvato. Because she's a financial geek. She yeah. loved it. She geeked out. I like that stuff. It's fun. I had my slide ruler out and my calculator and my legal pad, and I was making notes. Hey, don't tick her off. Don't make her mad now. You know, I, I didn't say that about her. You said that, <laughs> Murph. I was repeating what you said earlier in our pre-show. But I'm, I'm going to reach out to you, Sandy, because uh, they would like to talk to you. They, they heard about your message. I sent them a copy of your message, and they were uh, extremely pleased that you thought that about them, and they're said, that, hey, we'd like to meet her. So you've got fans. Sandy Salvato has uh, You can has show fans. up voluntarily with your attorney or a subpoena. It's up to you. So. <laughs> it's no, not, not like, really. It's not like that. Not like that. No. Hey, well, speaking of setting up the episode, because that's what it says in my notes here. It says, after small town police blotters set up episode. So there we are go. setting up the next episode. So this one, um, 
just through a variety of things, we actually had to get the U.S. Marshals involved. We brought Billy Sarukas out of retirement to track this guy down. <laughs> And I'm glad we did because we had a good time Absolutely. with our next gentleman, Mark Tappan. And Steve, you, I mean, this is another one that came to us through uh, another one of our heroes, Christy Schiller. It is. Christy Schiller with Canines for Cops and Canines for Kids. Thank you very much. Uh, Mark, as you'll hear, is a sergeant with the Alpharetta, Georgia Police Department. Alpharetta is uh, part of the uh, uh, metro Atlanta, Georgia area. This guy is hilarious. And you got to check him out on his on his fan page, and we'll we'll post this uh, on the show as well on social media. The guy's got what is it five million followers on TikTok? Is that uh, right? it's it's outrageous? Yeah, and Instagram, he's got a couple hundred thousand. I mean, it's just, the, but it's all about canine Mattis. It's not about yeah. him. It's yeah. about his dog. And and he doesn't mind. Um, uh, would you call it self deprecating humor, or he doesn't mind putting himself out there to have some fun with it? Um, just, uh, this was one of the most fun interviews we've done. It was hilarious. Uh, Mark has a good head on his shoulders. It's, it's kind of odd. You hear about his career where all he went and everything, but it, it helps you understand in the long run what motivated him to become a lifelong police officer. He's doing a fantastic job. If I was the chief in Alpharetta, you know what? I'd be very proud that this guy's represent my agency the way he is. And well, I was proud of him until he became a smart ass. And I left that edit in because we we had a problem. We had a little glitch. <laughs> and then Murph asked the question again, and he acted like a smart ass. And I'm going, okay, pal, teach you a lesson. We're leaving this edit in. So you will come up upon a section not that far into the uh, episode. And it's going to sound like we made a mistake and forgot to cut something out. I was going to cut it out, <laughs> and you'll hear Mark's response. And Mark, this is our, <laughs> this is the penalty you pay for being a smartass on the show. But we just told everybody we don't take anything serious ourselves, so it's, it turns out to be funny and hilarious. And Mark, thank you so much for your sense of humor, brother. It's it's it was a pleasure and honor to have you on here. Oh yeah, and it's uh, when you hear about his dog and uh, canine Mattis and what he's done with him and the impact. Of what I really like, Murph, is the positive impact. Yeah, he has had using this dog. The way, you know, beyond just be beyond being a patrol dog. But, hey, if we're going to hear about the story and hear about all the fun stuff and hear about the edit, I intentionally left in. <laughs> I have to ask you one question, Murph. Are you ready to play the biggest, baddest, most dangerous and canine friendly in this episode, Game of All, the Game of Crimes? Hey, everybody, you're going to love this one, I promise you. So get in, sit down, shut up and hold on. Let's hear from Mark and let's hear all about Mattis. You're going to love it. Hey, welcome, 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 welcome back. We have got some fun stuff here. And in fact, this is our uh, 97th installment of another Christy Schiller. No, we're just kidding, not 97th. <laughs> uh, another person from that fabulous person, Canines for Cops, Canines for Kids, Christy Schiller. She has given us, and we've had to track, we almost had to deploy our own jo dog to track this guy down because he's been hard to nail down, man. <laughs> he is. I love uh, it. It's a, the, you know, this guy gets a little celebrity status and he doesn't have time for his peons anymore. Yeah, What's five, up with that? Five million people on TikTok, Please. you know, 100,000 on Instagram, and we're, we're the little people. He doesn't talk to us anymore. So he's here's the guy who's not going to talk to us except for the next two hours. Mark Tappan, welcome to the show, Mark. Hey guys, I am glad to be here. Let's get this right. <laughs> this is Sergeant Mark Tappan with Alpharetta, Georgia PD. That's right. And I'll tell you what, Murph, you know what I'm talking about here. We almost had to call out Billy Sarukas to track his ass down. Had we done that, we would have found him. <laughs> From Marshall Service. Hey, yeah. just, to, just to correct one of those numbers, Instagram, I looked up this morning, that's 265,000 followers you got on there, brother. That's pretty damn good. <laughs> wow. Yeah, people like dogs. Well, I, I, you know what? I'm just sitting here looking Certainly at Certainly not thinking, your face, pal. I was thinking, <laughs> no. you ain't that pretty. <laughs> it is not. <laughs> Oh, this is going to be fun. Hey, no, look, yeah. we, 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 we had a tough time tracking him down because he's a busy guy. But the, yeah. the th interesting thing was, we're going to get into this, is that out of all the people we've talked to, you by far are going to, you've got the biggest social media following between TikTok, Instagram, YouTube. You know, we'll talk about the books you've written because uh, you wrote three books based on your experiences with Mattis, who was your canine. And we'll talk about 
where things are with that. But first, as we do with everybody, and this was really fun, too, when we had Michael uh, Franzese on. He was a capo regime, the Colombo crime family. He said, how did you get started in this thing of ours? Because he was really involved in this thing of ours. So, But with you, Mark, what, what led you into this life you call law enforcement? You know, was it a family member? Was it an interest? Were you arrested several times as a youth? You know, let us <laughs> share. Yeah, so it was one of those that I, um, I've i always had a strong sense of justice, and it always irked me pretty hard whenever I saw unfair um, circumstances for any person. And so that was kind of ingrained in me from uh, just early childhood. Maybe it's just in your DNA. I don't know. Um, I'm sure you guys can relate to, to some of that is you, just, you don't like seeing things that are not right happen to people. Oh, I thought you were talking about um, me, me having run-ins with the law. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. What you said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was that one. Well, it could be, right? Even that, right, is is seeing things that just are I, – I'm an altruist through and through. Is I, I really believe in this idea of the United States of America uh, and the Constitution of the United States of America. And so those things mean a lot to me, and my entire adult life has been sworn to protect that. So I actually was kind of a, a – a, a, ship at sea without a rudder for a while there. My intention was to become a game show host. Um, and I was going <laughs> really? to call. Oh, yeah, no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. You don't get to gloss over this. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> oh, no. Let's go. Let's go back here. Um, uh, show us Pat what the says. <laughs> yeah. So what? It was what more games? Mark Summers from Double Dare, which might be just a tad after you guys, because you look like you have a little more gray hair than I do. Well, no, actually, I have more hair than both of you guys put together. So that's a, that's a leading Correct. question combined. No, so, <laughs> tell, us. so tell us about, for, for us old folks, they call boomers. I, I, I'm familiar with the vernacular. So what, what was uh, this Mark Summers and Double Dare? What was the premise of the show? Oh, it was like uh, kids. It was, uh, I think it was on Nickelodeon. And kids would compete in all these little, like, challenges. It was like obstacle courses and all these other things. And they dumped slime on them. And it was just all kinds of fun. And I was like, man, I want the job of Mark Summers. And I want to be that game show host. Like, that looks like just an amazing job. So, well, so was, what did, you, what did yeah. you do to work towards that? Well, I went to, I went to Southeastern Louisiana University. Um, and took uh, lots well, hold of on a second. I'm, I'm failing to see the link between being a game show host in Southeastern Louisiana. Was that yeah. the hub for game show host? I mean, what? <laughs> no, well, I, I was in telecommunications. Like, that was my, my major. Um, and so I was, but the first year in, I was taking lots of PE classes and some basic courses and I ended up on academic probation. And I remember kind of just sitting there thinking, <laughs> I don't know if this game show host is going to work out <laughs> like my path. I, I wasn't really good at planning at that point. Wait a minute. How did you get on academic probation with a bunch of PE classes? I <laughs> yeah. mean, that's usually easy. Well, the, only, <laughs> the only reason I didn't flunk out was because of the PE classes. I was taking oh. like bowling running, Aikido, uh, tennis, and those were the only classes that I was passing. This sounds like a country club, not a college. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize you could take so many PE classes in just two semesters, but I did. Well, I, and we, and our listeners, we can see Mark as we're doing the interview, although we only record the audio. And I'm looking at it, so you look like a pretty healthy young man there. You, you're hitting the weights pretty good. You're staying in the gym. Yeah, I try. <laughs> I try. Well, I guess that one thing kind of stuck with me right is is the whole pe <laughs> you i sailed at that, that. excellent so, yeah. but did you ever did you ever get to the point where you had a tryout a demo did you ever get to that point of being a game show host oh, anything no. no 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 it was just i you know it was one of those i really didn't like that was kind of a oh i'm gonna be a game show host i didn't really have a plan for my life and it was one that college and failing at college made me realize that I better, I better, I, I lacked a lot of things in my life and I needed to start building those things in my life. I got to tell you, out of all the interviews we've done, Murph, I've never heard anybody said I wanted to be a game show host. Yeah, so me this either. Is the first. <laughs> <laughs> now, did, did you grow up in the Atlanta area? Was that home? No, no, no. I grew up in Louisiana, just north of New Orleans. Oh, okay. Yeah. That explain, explains so I, why you went to college down there. That's correct, sir. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the mascot of the college? Uh, the Lions. I, was, I, I thought you were going to say like it, it, Cajuns and everybody's name ends in E-U-X, you know, Thibodeau. And, That's right. No. Boudreau. And... Boudreau, yeah, Thibodeau. So, uh, but now did you did you finish college? Did you find a bunch no, more PE classes to take? Not then? Not then. No, it was one. So like I said, I, I knew I lacked 
like self-discipline, responsibility, leadership, like things that you need to make it in the real world. Um, and uh, I have someone in my – this all leads to why I got into law enforcement, I promise you. Um, but there's someone in my life that really means a lot to me, my uncle, um, Marcus, and he's a former Marine. And this guy, he exudes leadership, responsibility, work ethic, character, like all these qualities that I was like, wow, I really – I lack these and I need to do something about it. So without telling my parents, without telling anyone, I, I went and joined the Marine Corps. And, Good for you. Uh, yeah, the goal was to end up in law enforcement because of I knew I had a strong sense of justice. The game show host was a very low percentage of actually working out, which I still have hope for now, by the way, um, that this might come to fruition. But anyway, I well, digress. We're looking at your following. I'm looking at the numbers here again. Holy cow, you've got a following, man. Yeah, yeah, maybe it'll, maybe we have maybe an idea. We have an idea for a game. We'll talk to you about later. But this is top secret. Like we it. can't share. We we have a great okay. a great idea yeah, for a game. All right, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of scared getting another kiss a little bit. With oh, this game, <laughs> I've had plenty of time to think of this one. So, uh, hey, but by the way, too, uh, salute you. Uh, my son-in-law is a Marine, formerly on active duty. He was actually over in Afghanistan under Mattis, under oh, Mad nice. Dog. And oh, nice. Served, you know. So appreciate. Hey, no, always. Uh, um, I was Army. Uh, you know, A comes before M, just in case you know. Uh, shapes and colors for Marines. That's what we have to do. Keep it simple. <laughs> Mark, I'm going to give you that's his the address. The best you got Definitely. is alphabetically your superior. That's the, that's the argument that you Oh, no, for. that's the only one you'll understand. <laughs> if I got into the more complex <laughs> stuff, I'd really have to explain it. So we keep it simple for the Marines. Mark, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you his home address so you can bring one of your dogs up to say hello to him when you're, you know, at, your, at your convenience. Well, thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> I'll just throw crayons in the yard. Mark will get distracted and everything will be good. Get hungry. That's correct. Get if hungry. That's already, though, you're in trouble. There you go. <laughs> you anyway, awesome. back to our regularly. And somebody somebody just put up a meme about this tumor. If I say I digress, or now back to our regularly scheduled podcast, they turned it into a drinking game. So <laughs> I saw that. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. So and I said it. I didn't even know this. <laughs> well, and I said it too. Now back to our, you know, I digress, but now back to our regularly scheduled podcast. So for those of you out there listening, you should be up on three <laughs> drinks now. So yeah, and as you see, Mark, we may be drunk before this is over. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. I don't have anything handy. <laughs> Can, Coffee, brother. Coffee. There we go. That's what I'm on right now. All right. So, uh, but anyway, so you, let's talk about your uncle then. So he served yeah. honorably in the Marines. He was a role model for you. Did you have yep. a discussion with him about going into law enforcement? No, no, no. I, I don't have discussions about much. I just, I, I'm one of those who just kind of jumps out of the plane and then hopefully everything will work out. So it's one of those that when I, I make a decision, I, I'm very, I'm quick to act. And uh, it, at times, you know, it's gotten me in trouble, but I've learned a lot throughout the years. And, uh, you know, as I've gotten older, I learned that you might want to research some things before you act. So a friend of mine was a was a SEAL, actually, um, uh -huh. and he we were working together. And when he came in, when he says, I'm moving, I stabbed the lifeboat. And I didn't understand that phrase. I said, what do you mean you stabbed the lifeboat? He says... I just quit. Uh, we're moving. I said, do you have a plan? He said, no, I'll figure it out. But that was the mer that's the SEAL version. You stabbed the lifeboat. It's like you better make it. a decision, man, because that thing is running out of air pretty quick. Yep. Yep. That's it. And that's – man, the Marine Corps was perfect for me. It really was. It, I, and I cherished my time, man. But my – it was kind of – I went to the recruiter um, and knew that I probably wanted to go into law enforcement. So I was like, hey, I, I'd like to be an MP. And I'm really glad I didn't go that route. <laughs> Honestly, and he's like, "Oh, you don't want to be an MP. You want to be security forces." And I'm like, "I do." And he goes, "Yes, you do. <laughs> You're perfect for the Marines." Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> if you think so, he uh, <laughs> he uh, he he's like, um, "You'll be guarding the president." I'm like, "I will." This is amazing. You'll be working embassies all over. The uh, long story short, I ended up on an island, like a Diego Garcia in the middle of the Indian Ocean, guarding Standing post. nothing, <laughs> nothing, trees and crabs. That's all I was guarding. Anyway, <laughs> yes, but um, were any of them stolen on your watch? Not, not one. Good job. Not one. Good job. We actually lost our. Yeah, there's a whole another story that goes along with that. But we lost oh, our no, mission. No, you, so you don't get to throw that stuff out and say, "Ah, oh, now forget <laughs> it. Let's hear the story." Well, okay. So fast forward, I'm in security forces, which is, it's kind of funny too. If you go back to the recruiter, I'm like, why does it say 03 XY? 03 is the designation for infantry. Right. And he's like, oh, don't worry about that. 
<laughs> I should have worried about that, right? It's one of those okay. that you kind of okay. pay attention Pro to. Tip, anytime a recruiter says don't worry about it, you should worry about it. <laughs> Correct. So if, if you are looking to go into military service and they say don't worry about it, good good point. Um, uh, but I'm really glad I ended up where I did. But it was so I'm in security forces. Eventually, that's a year commitment because I was in a hardship duty station in Diego Garcia. After that, I went infantry. But while we were there for a year on this on this deserted island, we had a drill, and uh, it was a live drill. Everyone knew about it except for the Navy, apparently, and they were a large part of it. And so we're running this live drill, and we're treating it as if there's a threat against this communication station, and a Navy chief comes out. And he's not responding to our command, so we end up like hip tossing him, throwing him on the ground. <laughs> we have a, a saw right in his face, right? And I, I don't think it was loaded because it was just a, a drill, but whatever. You know, there was a saw in his face. Saw squad automatic weapon M two four nine, shoots five five six. Got a two hundred round drum, fires a lot nice. of nice. So we got that in his face. It's shoulder fired, and uh, after that we. Uh, we're told to stand down from our mission in Diego Garcia. So really, we were just there to guard the coconuts. <laughs> and and just for the folks, you need to go to Google Maps and put it in there because when he says Diego Garcia is in the middle of nowhere, to <laughs> to the to the west is Africa, to the east is Singapore, and there is Diego Garcia. <laughs> Another drink. There is nothing close. <laughs> yeah, it's called, and as you as you look at it, uh, they call it the footprint of freedom. We call it the toilet seat of him. <laughs> it's the ass end of the world right there. <laughs> no, that's Djibouti. That's different. Um, yeah. So, but where, where else through the world did you go? We digressed again. I don't know if you noticed that. We digressed. Uh, now back to our regularly scheduled podcast. <laughs> yeah. Now you're up four drinks now. <laughs> yep. So uh, I went, um, Dio Garcia was my first major duty station after uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot, San Diego. Then I went to Virginia for the security forces training. Diego Garcia. Then I, I went out to Camp Pendleton, was there for a while. Um, up in San Mateo, the north end of Camp Pendleton, if you know anything about Camp Pendleton. Went over to Okinawa for a little bit. Went to Korea. <laughs> There's another funny story that's um, – I, I went to Saudi. I went to the – see, I was in uh, – No, re- rewind <laughs> – Cut back to Korea. No, it's See, not your Korea. Mistake? It's not Korea. It's this next. It's the one that I'm talking about. It's the next one. Right okay. All right. We're waiting then. Stay, we're standing by. Yeah, I went to I went to Saudi and Kuwait, and it was right after what was it Desert Shield and before Desert Storm was when I was at ninety four to ninety eight, and so it was kind of peacetime. There was some um, there was some UN peacekeeping things that were going on, but that was about it. Uh, but. <laughs> If you look in my service record book, I got danger pay for my deployment to the Middle East. And the reason that I got it was I was on the Marine Corps volleyball wow. team. And so I got to go to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and get danger pay. And it was kind of funny. I was I got an award later in life, uh, you know, when I'm working with my dog here as a police officer. And the VFW honored us. And there's the guys in there from Vietnam, from Korea, wow. uh, from Desert Storm, Afghanistan, right? And uh, there's a guy from Omaha Beach that's in there. And they're like, oh, would you like to join? We, you know, we, we, we heard you that you got some danger pay, which qualifies you for the VFW. And I'm like, I could, I could not hold my head up high and <laughs> be here with Omaha Beach. And here I am. I, I played volleyball in the sandbox. That's, that's what I'm here for. That's no bueno. So anyway. This is called integrity. So you didn't join the VFW. I didn't join the VFW because I, I would have been embarrassed every time I walked through the door of being in, in presence of these heroes. Yeah, but you know, but that says a lot about you too, because let me tell you, there are some people, um, we won't mention them. Most people serve honorably, but there are some people who go out of the way, they get a little paper cut and their next thing they're looking for is a purple heart. They're saying, oh no, look, I'm combat wounded. Well, well, so I mean, we're we're dis- we're uncovering a lot of hidden gems here. We thought we were going to talk about dogs, yet we're talking about the <laughs> ass end of the world, Diego Garcia, <laughs> combat pay in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. By the way, my um, 
nephew was uh, uh, military intelligence, went through Fort Huachuca. He was over and he was uh, started off in Iraq uh, during uh, Desert Storm and then ended up in Kuwait, right, finished the rest of his time there. Right so now, Mark. you guys may have okay. you guys may have been in the same place at the same time. But uh, that's pretty cool. Unless he played volleyball, probably not. But, but you would have been in the same country at the same time. So. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, That's what go. same place at the same time means. I didn't mean the volleyball court. You know? ah. <laughs> Again, I'm sorry, I forgot, Marine. Got well, to explain, got to talk slow right. and use monosyllabic words. Uh, that means one syllable, Murph. Um, <laughs> uh, all right. So, but how long, how long did you serve this great country of ours we call America before you got out of the core? Yeah, only four years. And it was one that I actually, um, during my time in, uh, I, I kind of realized, like, like I said, that Marine Corps taught me so much, but one of the things it taught me too was kind of the hypocrisy in my life, um, where I, I grew up going to church and everything else, but kind of realized that my, my life didn't match the things that I was saying I believed. And so, um, gave my life over to Jesus. And this is another part of how I became a law enforcement officer, I promise. Um, but gave my, so I got saved in, in the Marine Corps. Otherwise I probably would have stayed in until retirement. I absolutely loved it. I loved being in the infantry. Um, I was an 0311. I loved being a bullet catcher. Uh, I, it, it, was, it was fun for me. Uh, I enjoyed the camaraderie. I enjoyed the things that I learned. Um, the way that you learn to, to love people from all over the world, right, is, is here you, it doesn't matter your religious beliefs, the color of your skin, anything else, you're, you're fighting next to your brother. And that's all and brothers and sisters now, but it, it's one of those that that's all that mattered. And so it taught me a lot about life that was invaluable and I absolutely loved it. And, but it brought me closer to Jesus. And I actually, uh, I started volunteering at a church and that was kind of my, my next step, um, was I went into to ministry. And so I went from the Marine Corps, um, into ministry and did that for about 10 years. And it was kind of funny. It was one of those that I, I knew my time in ministry was coming to an end. And I look back at the, at the puzzle pieces of my life and uh, game show host really wasn't a part of that at that point because it, that really never panned out. But I had Marine Corps and I had ministry. And I thought the perfect combination of the two was law enforcement. And it was the reason that I kind of went into the Marine Corps in the first place was to get out so that I could get out and go into law enforcement. Uh, the cool thing as I look back too was I wasn't ready when I came out of the Marine Corps. I don't think I had the maturity that I needed to be in law enforcement. And I'm, I'm sure you've encountered people in law enforcement that are like that, that they get into it uh, with the wrong reasons. And it was, God had another plan where he prepared me and put me in ministry so I could have the compassion and the empathy side of law enforcement that you really need to have besides the just um, disdain for injustice, right? You can't just have the disdain for injustice with that to be a good cop. Um, without the compassion and empathy. So, so uh, let's roll yeah, back for a second. Kinda... Uh, hold on. You, you, made, you, yeah. you, you made an interesting comment. You said you knew your time in the ministry was coming to an end. What did you do? Yeah. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> Spike somebody in the volleyball game what and take out one do? of the other ministers? <laughs> I, no. Well, <laughs> it reminds me of two. So I, I was playing dodgeball as a junior high pastor one time, and I bounced a girl's head off the wall with the dodgeball. I felt awful about that. Um, and well, then when you're talking the about problem, did it, did it deflate the ball or what, what happened? Oh, What's the problem there? She was the sweetest. <laughs> oh, kid oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, I, I, I got a horrible. question for you too. Were you an ordained minister? What, uh, what, uh, what, I think we just lost you. Can you hear there me? There we go. Yeah. We lost you there for a second. Did you lose oh. one of your pieces? No, I took it out. It wasn't working. Oh, okay. Been doing that. So were, were you an ordained hey, hold on, minister? Mark. I sure let was. Me, let me oh. stop. Uh, let me make a quick note of this because I'm going to – I'll count us back in again so I can cut this part out. We're at okay. – uh, all right. 20 basically minutes. Okay. So let's do that again. I'll go three, two, one, and then you ask that, Murph. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one. Hey, Mark, were you an ordained minister? That's a great question. I didn't <laughs> see it coming. Uh, yeah, I sure was. <laughs> Oh, uh, uh, that, that's funny. You know, our listeners don't know why that's funny. <laughs> it's funny because we, we had to, we had a little sorry, glitch I, here in recording <laughs> that's getting edited out. <laughs> Maybe not now. I think I'm just going to leave it in that. since he's such a smart ass about it. You should have been a game show host. You should be a comedian, man. This is hilarious. 
I should, oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. We'll see where, where life takes uh, me. Uh, what what uh, what what branch of the uh, religion? Like you know, what, in the military, what, what branch denomination? <laughs> That's what he means to say. Yeah, it was, so it was non-denominational, but we had ties to the Southern Baptist Convention. So, my dad was a Southern Baptist minister. Is that right? That's great. Yeah, yeah, and I, like I said, that was a great time in my life. That, um, but but you said you knew it was coming to an end. How did you know it was coming to an end? Well, so it kind of goes back to my altruist type things, and it, it, this is not a not right. It's one of those that. As you grow in, and get older, you kind of – you realize that the world isn't perfect and not everyone is perfect, and that's not ha- the standard you should necessarily hold people to. Um, our church went through a split, and it was one of those that I saw some some personalities and things come forward, and they were acting on their perspective, which is kind of a mature thing to be able to, in retrospect, go back and look at it that way. Um, while you're going through it, I didn't necessarily, I, I couldn't understand why people didn't see it the exact way that I saw it. And so because of that, it was like, okay, well, it's time for me to move on. And I was getting a little bit older in youth ministry and I didn't want to be a senior pastor. I just wanted to be in youth ministry. Um, so I realized that I had a decision to make. And if, you know, I had a family at this time, I had a a wife, a uh, daughter, and another one on the way, and it was it was time to figure something out if I wasn't going to do this for the rest of my life. So, where were you at the time when you made that decision? I was in uh, San Juan Capistrano, California. I remember, I remember, because <laughs> I was kind of walking through, and it was uh, California is like it really is beautiful. The climate is perfect. It was like at sunset. I was out on a walk with my my pregnant wife uh, pushing my daughter, who's now in college, and the baby stroller and our cute little beagle. Um, and I remember thinking, man, life is perfect and really, uh, really couldn't get any better. And that's when the church split and all chaos ensued. And I was like, oh, wow, it's time to move on with life. <laughs> that's, you know, that's uh, and? a church splitting is really an ugly event. Um, yeah. The, the church I went to in high school that really kept me out of trouble uh, had a very active youth group. You know, we we actually put together these little stage shows. And, and at one point we had like 400 kids in this little small town in southern West Virginia. And wow. we're going out, you know, going out on the road doing uh, shows at churches and high schools and things like that. And some of the older folks in the church uh, thought too much attention was being paid to the young people and, and ultimately ended up in a, in a split of the church. And it's just it can really devastate an entire congregation. Um, you know, it just, it causes enemies, especially in a small town. Yeah. And that's hard to see, you know, <laughs> I hate that. So you're in California, Yep. but now we're talking now where you're currently located, which is where? Uh, Georgia. So how did you make it from California to Georgia in the great state of Georgia? As a friend of mine said, it's spelled J-O-J-A for you non jojans out there. <laughs> how did you, how did you, how did you make it from California to Georgia? My sister lived in the area. And so it was like, wow. Well, and I love my sister. She played a big role in my life. Um, just, she was uh, closest to me in age and kind of, and she's seven years older than me. So I, I was a baby of the family and she, she did a lot. She's meant a lot throughout my life. Um, one of the main reasons that I, I came to realize that my life was full of hypocrisy was just how amazing she was, right? It was never something that she wasn't a judgy type of person. She just, she loved me um, when I was acting like a fool. <laughs> when I was acting like a, a single Marine might act, um, she was just a great example of, of of love. And so it was one of those that she meant a lot. And that's why I decided to to move to Georgia and change careers completely with my family that was ever growing. Uh, it's remember, would you say stab, stab the lifeboat, stab the lifeboat. <laughs> That's what I did. I just, I was like, all right, we're I, my, my dear wife, who's a saint. And for some reason has stayed with me. It's one of those that I'm like, Hey, we're going to move to Georgia and uh, I'm going to start a new career. How's that sound? You know, with one on the way, and and then how did that go? Over? How did that discussion go over? She was like, uh, "If it's what we're supposed to do, let's do it. Stab it, stab that life lifeboat. Let's go." 
Let me, so. let me tell you what, Mark, I, I'm believing what you're saying. And I know Morgan's wife and I know my wife, we all three married up. I'm telling you. <laughs> that's, and that's if we don't sure. say that, we'll get our asses beat. So that's yes, right. we married up. I'm so. afraid of my wife. <laughs> <laughs> She's a tough girl. <laughs> uh, I love it. So, but when you, so you got out to Georgia, was it the same place you're at now, which is Alpharetta? Yep. Same place. I tested. It's the only place that I uh, applied and tested for. Um, and, and I got it and it, it was interesting too. Like it was a good competition. There's probably 150 people trying for, uh, four spots and I end up getting one of them. So, wow. You know, Mark, you know, you may not know this about me, but I've been stationed in, in Atlanta twice with DEA and, uh, lived out in Swanee the first time and up and coming the second time. Yeah. And uh, Alpharetta was a, uh, uh, recognized as one of the leading police departments, especially in Fulton County. So you guys had an excellent reputation up there. Gwinnett. You know, PD was uh, top notch as well, and then uh, Marietta yeah. and up in that way. Good, good agency, man. That's a really good agency. Yeah, I was, I was happy to get on with them. Yeah. What year did you start there? I started in two thousand and six. You're a rookie still. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Sixteen years, nah, rookie. Um, that's okay. You're getting there. So, but, uh, but when you move, when you moved out there, and you, so just tell us you know, kind of briefly about what was the, you got hired on, you're one of four that gets hired on, but what's, did, does Alpharetta run their own academy? Did you go to a state academy? How did that work? We went, uh, it was a, uh, a regional academy through Clayton County Police Department. So anyone who had no law enforcement um, experience before, they sent through a paramilitary. Um, and I'm smiling because it was kind of funny because I came from the Marine Corps and they called it paramilitary. And I just thought it was, it was hilarious. Like it was, it was, it was more like <laughs> Navy boot camp to you, wasn't it? Or maybe yeah, Air Force. Yeah. It was like easy. Yeah. It was nothing. It was, and I found it really entertaining and they knew that I found it entertaining, which was even better <laughs> for me. <laughs> so it was, it was good, but it was Clayton County PD put on the, the Academy. It was fantastic. Um, yeah, I remember I was the I was the guide, right? Or what did they call it? Class leader. Um, it would have been for the the police academy, and uh, they had us write. There's so many funny stories, but they had us write papers every night. And I'm like, there's no way because someone would get in trouble, and so we had to write a paper every night on some law enforcement topic. And I'm like, there's no way that they're reading these. And so I started getting creative with my writing, <laughs> and like someone forgot, someone forgot a. Uh, uh, a piece of equipment, like a flashlight or something they were supposed to bring on, on their uh, duty belt. And uh, so I wrote this whole paper about how Batman uh, could not be Batman if he ever forgot things for his utility belt and how Robin, um, you know, it was just this whole you know story that I went into it was a, <laughs> like a three page essay. Um, and uh, they didn't say a word about it. Right. And so I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, I continue to do so. And then at the end of the day, my, um, my leader, right, uh, pulls me aside and he's like, tap it. I say, I say, I'm like, oh crap, they are reading these. <laughs> so I had to change. <laughs> anyway. That's hilarious. Well, hey, they no, probably no. made their day, you know? Yeah. I see you would have wrote it saying, hey, look, I'm not saying I'm Batman. I'm, I'm not saying I'm not Batman, but just <laughs> Batman and me have never been in the room, same room at the same time. I mean, you can go figure. Right. So, so it seems to me if with our folks who have been through the federal – courses like the DEA, the Academy, they had to write memos. So it seems like uh, you had your share of uh, writing memos. By the way, I have to ask you, mm -hmm. almost a badge of honor for most Marines, especially, you know, uh, the enlisted, the infantry, is you get busted back a couple times. You ever get busted back in the Marines? No, I never did. I actually got meritoriously promoted twice. Sweet. How did you manage that in Diego Garcia? Oh, that's yeah. right. You were on the volleyball team. Yeah. <laughs> he was a good volleyball player. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm short, but I could spike. It was the weirdest thing. So they're like, hey, let's give you some rank, boy. <laughs> let's give you some rank. <laughs> all right. So, uh, but but you go through all of that. How long was your academy? Uh, well, it's 12 weeks. Not, nothing major. Marine Corps basic. How long was that? That was 12 weeks, 12 right? Weeks. Wasn't it? Yep. Yeah. You could do that standing on your head. This was like, ah, oh, this is easy. We, it, it was hilarious. Yeah. Did that was, attitude get you in more trouble other than that uh, little paper you wrote about Batman and Robin? No, because, I mean, I, I mean, you can kind of tell how I am. I write papers about Batman and Robin and stuff. But I, at the same time, you have that, you know, the military bearing where you know when and where you can get away with stuff. And so, yeah, it, it was it never got me in too much trouble. As you walk through your as you go through your career, at some point, um, 
when you were going through the academy, did they do any demonstrations about anything that caught your interest, like canines, like SWAT, like anything else? Did did anything pique your interest during the academy? Um, well, Lieutenant McCaslin was our our leader, and he was with Clayton County PD, and he was he was an impressive individual. He had certifications, and just he was an expert in everything, right? And I mean, not one who tells you that he's an expert in everything. He's one of those that it's just like. You can tell by the way he carries himself, the way he does his job. This guy is locked on. And I was like, that's someone I would like to emulate. Um, he, not, he didn't have any experience, I don't believe, in um, canine. But I do remember him talking about SWAT. So the And with my Marine Corps background, that was always one of my goals is when I got into law enforcement is to get into SWAT. And did you end up in SWAT? I did. All right. Well, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about it. Took you a little while to answer. I don't know if the was the neurons aren't firing that fast because you haven't had seventeen cups no. of crappy coffee. But uh, <laughs> I was trying to build suspense. I, I heard it. Out. <laughs> it worked. To, Dramatic <laughs> effect. Trying to build suspense. Well, All right, that's game show host coming out. What's he gonna say? <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Not for not for that one. Uh, and you know what? Now I've decided we're going to leave that edit in when you were such a smart ass to Murph. Oh, I didn't see that one coming about what the nominee. All right. We're just going to leave. Folks, That's you're going to love yeah, that. We're just going to leave that edit in. So but uh, so as you st- started on the road, you know, what were yeah. some of the what were some of the fun things that were happening in Alpharetta, Georgia? You know, what kind of what was like the type of crime you guys were getting? What kind of calls were you handling quite a bit? Well, you know, and, and tell everybody tell everybody where Alpharetta is, how how what it's close to, and how big your agency is, population, and so forth. We border coming. Um, I actually live right on the border of coming and Alpharetta right now. Um, it's 17 miles north of Atlanta. Uh, it's kind of a suburb. It really has. It's probably changed a lot since you've been around. Um, it's really grown into uh, quite the nice, small, big city. Like it's it's growing quite a bit. It's about 70,000 residents. But during the day, because of uh, just businesses and everything else, it swells to about 300,000 people that are in the city. Wow. So, yeah, good traffic, everything else. So it's a, it's a fun city. Um, back when I started, it was a little bit less. Uh, definitely the downtown wasn't built up like it is now. Um, but you had, you know, if you've worked nights in law enforcement, drunks always keep you entertained at night. So that was always fun. But the majority of our crime up here is property crime, cars getting broken into things like that. So, um, yeah, it was, it was good. And I had my share of, you know, this was back to when they let you pursue cars. And so I had some, some car chases that got the blood pumping. Um, those were, those were fun and learning experiences of, uh, you know, they tell you about tunnel vision, but you don't understand tunnel vision till you get tunnel vision. And then you're like, wow, I should pay attention to things like this and tunnel vision. Basically like I was in a, in a chase one time, um, in a stolen car, uh, went down. There's 400 is the interstate that kind of comes north out of Atlanta, um, breaks off of 85 and 75. And so we go down and there's something called the perimeter. That's a, a big interstate that goes around, uh, Atlanta hit the perimeter chasing this car crash. Um, but I, the whole time I didn't realize I didn't have backup. I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't giving out great location. I, I think I told him my final spot, but that was about it. And then I was fighting some guys and, you know, they're trying to get through to me on the radio and, you know, I'm focused on, uh, hold on, I'm fighting. So let me, let me handle <laughs> this. Busy. Didn't realize the importance of the radio. So there was a lot of, you know, you learn things throughout your career. And it was one of those that that never happened again. Now I know that the radio is your friend and you got to keep a, a wider perspective than that tunnel vision. So yeah, it was great times. Love. I, I love it. Like I, I love this job. I love the job part of this job. I should say. First chase I ever got in as a rookie Salina police officer it was actually a sheriff's office son. We didn't know it till later, but uh, we're going into the county and the dispatchers ask me, well, okay, what's your position? How close are you behind the vehicle? And I went 50 feet and he goes, back off, back off. <laughs> I was way too close going 80 miles an hour down a country road. I, I thought, okay, let me get up on this guy. Not realizing he taps his brakes. We're both wrecking. So awesome. yeah, you talk about that's it. You know, the tunnel vision, it's like you put it in perspective, you know, and the, the radio, the dispatchers are your lifeline. They were mine when I was a trooper out there in the middle of nowhere. You got to have those things. So um, when was your first exposure to, uh, uh, was your first exposure to SWAT or canine before you joined and started doing those? Well, um, I remember when I was a rookie, like the day one, one of my supervisors had a huge dog named Blue. 
um, huge German shepherd. And the first, and I, I don't know anything about canines. My dad, my dad used to field train labs growing up. So I've always been around like intelligent, um, working dogs, but, uh, I've never been around a police canine before. And Sergeant Nick Curry was my supervisor. And I was meeting with that him. That sounds like a Marvel time. character. That's a great Nick, name. Sergeant Nick Fury, Nick, Nick Curry. Curry. Yeah, he's a good dude. I, I, I He's still uh, in the area with a different different organization. And, you know, he, he I've always had high respect for him. But the first thing he ever said to me was he's like, he introduced himself. He had his dog out next to him. And then he looks at Blue and he says, Blue, kill tapping. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, what is this like are, hazing? Are, are you kidding <laughs> and, and the dog was probably trained in, in german or dutch or something like that so the, the dog did not kill me <laughs> fun story so here i am today but that was the first time but i it piqued my interest and there was another supervisor that i had um that had a dog and was always willing to show me like their capabilities and so i was always fascinated with that um and then I wanted SWAT was something like, despite my lack of acumen and in, in academics early on, the Marine Corps gave me a lot of self discipline, and I was pretty intelligent despite being a Marine. Right? Is I scored super high on the ASVAB. Like, there, <laughs> you why are we going to say if you score too high on the ASVAB, no, son, you're destined for the Army or Air Force. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> I say I actually could have been like. The smartest infantrymen are typically mortarmen because you have to do the math, math, yep, right <laughs> for trajectory and whatnot. Um, and they wanted me as a mortarman, but I was like, nah, I really, I really like the whole stab the lifeboat, like full force go in. I don't like doing the math. Let me, let me just run straight towards danger. So that's why. Um, but that's I, I wanted SWAT because it, the challenge. Like I, I love to challenge myself, um, and and try to excel in whatever I do. And so it was, our department went through this kind of split. Our chief went and started a new department in the area called Johns Creek. Um, and he took probably about, I think it was 20 something officers with Wait a him. Minute. I'm detecting a pattern here. You were in a church that split. Now you're in a police department that split. It's me. Dude, you're not good. <laughs> Hey, it's by the way, mean. too, we got a rule here. Uh, we, we have to define acronyms, and I violated it, too, when we said ASVAB. Yeah. For those who are uninformed, uh, that is the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. I thought you were going to ask me to <laughs> tell you what it – I could have gotten Armed Services. That's it. Armed yeah. Services – Vocational vacation. aptitude, but it's one of the tests you take, you know, uh, when you join up, and they kind of see, uh, yeah, are we going to make you a grunt? Are we going to make you a mortarman? Uh, you know, are you too you too smart? And now we're going to put you in a desk somewhere. But uh, right. Anyway, but so they split. So what? What? what I mean, was that just simply because the communities got too big? Uh, was it? Be, I, I mean, it's a different than a church split, right? It's oh, not yeah. an issue of ideology. It's an issue of just jurisdiction and coverage and tax base and all that other stuff, right? Right. Fulton County had an unincorporated, or unincorporated uh, portion that was becoming incorporated, and they needed a new police chief. And so a wise decision was to use someone who had been working in the area already and was our police chief, but we had a director of public safety. So it was kind of a an added thing where it really didn't hurt our department, except for the, the loss of manpower that you know we lost like 20 people and half of them were on the SWAT team. So that opened the door for me to slide into SWAT, even though I'd only been an officer for about a year and a half. So yeah, the John the Johns Creek area, that's a very, very nice area. Yeah. I like that area. It's very nice. Uh so you're only on a year and a half and now you got this opportunity for SWAT. What had it not been for this split in this new uh department, how long do you have to be on before you normally would have been able to test for SWAT? Um, I think it was two years, like right at two years, which I was coming up on right at two years. Um, but it's it it spots wouldn't have come open really that often um this they had a, a big need because there were so many people that left so um <laughs> low bar so i got in <laughs> i guess <laughs> no that's opportunities that's opportunity yeah. man so you took it you got on now um how was the swat training compared to your quote paramilitary training at the academy oh it, it's kind of same thing was like i went to a swat school and um, it was, it was fun because it was demanding and it was one that like, if you missed when we were doing shooting drills, it was, I think it was only a two week course. So it's not, it's not too long. Um, but we do shooting drills and stuff like that. If you missed one or, or dropped a shot, 
you'd have to, you and your battle buddy would have to run to the top of a tower, ring a bell, come back and do it again until you, you know, you miss none because there's zero room for, um, for mistakes in, in SWAT is kind of what they they try to build into you. So it was, I, I loved it because I loved the, it was physically demanding. Um, and then the shooting aspect, I just, I absolutely loved to shoot. So it was a good time. I loved it, but they were, they tried to be a little paramilitary, but yeah, it is what it is. If you were in good shape and could shoot, it didn't really matter. Yeah, and a lot of it too, especially with your own SWAT. It's it, or the other thing too, like you said, it's about this is where you really can't have tunnel vision. You got to be aware of who's on your left, who's on your right, yeah. who's behind. You take the shot, but what's behind the shot? Is right. it a wall? Is it a drywall? Is it a block wall? I mean, there's so many things. People think you just go in there and you pull the trigger, man. But before you pull the trigger, there's so many things that have to go through your head. Yeah, um, absolutely. Before you do that, so, um, so, but when when was your first introduction into canines? I mean, you're on the SWAT team for how long now? Uh, I was on SWAT for six years, and it was one that I would always volunteer to go. I, I love community relations, uh, and so I'd always I'd always volunteer for uh, like our touch a truck, where people could come and ask questions about SWAT, and we'd sit out there and we'd have all these cool gadgets and robots and and you know forty millimeter grenade launchers and body armor and like just the coolest stuff on in the world that I thought. Uh, and then the guy with the dog would would show up. And I knew this guy with a dog, and he wasn't even that nice of a guy. And he would show up with a dog, and people would flock to him. And I was like, what an amazing bridge. And I loved the capabilities of the dog, but I was like, we should really be taking advantage of that a little bit more. And so I was like, you know, that's that that sat in my brain, realizing the, the bridge that the dog could build between the community. Um, and also it showed me, too, that, even though we had all this cool stuff, people didn't necessarily want to talk to us that much as, as law enforcement officers, right? There's this kind of, you stand over there, they don't talk to you, but the second you introduce a dog, people want to make that connection. And so that, that was one of the reasons I was fascinated by what they could do. Like I said, I had a Sergeant that would always show me, right. Is he need help training? I would be the first to volunteer and go help him to lay a track or to just watch him work. I loved it. Did you wear the bite suit? Let me see if I can remember the first time I put on a bite suit. Um, I think it was like a tr- – it might have been when I tried out was the first time. And that's a – the first time you do – I absolutely love it now. But the first time you do it, it's quite the quite the experience as you have this crazed animal coming at you. And you're like, he's going to bite where? What do I do? What do I, what? Oh. <laughs> was it a Malinois? It <laughs> was it a – No, I think it was a shepherd. Which shepherds – mouths hit harder. Right, they'll just fling themselves at you, but shepherds bite harder. So, anyway, it was, uh, yeah, it was fantastic. And I remember six years on SWAT, one of the dogs was becoming available, and I talked to my dad, who field trained labs, knows my passion for dogs, and I'm like, Dad, I'm thinking about putting in for canine. And he goes, Well, you're not getting any younger. It'd be nice to have a dog chase instead of you. And I'm like, ah, that's a, that's a <laughs> It'd be valid nice point. to have a dog Drop in the in. family, son. Yeah. <laughs> that's a valid point. <laughs> not fast. Hey, no, look, that's a lesson I learned, too, is when you start getting older, it's like first you used to run after him. Mm -hmm. I got to the point where I was like, no, I'm going to take command. You get on the radio, you have the other young guys set a perimeter, (laughs) and then you get on the loudspeaker and you say, turn yourself in because you ain't going anywhere. You know, I just I didn't run anymore. But uh, so you so the the opening comes up. Did you was there any kind of special testing you had to do for the canine unit? Yeah, it was one that once again with SWAT, it was the same way. Like I if if I want something and this is when I was a kid, even if I want something, it's really hard to stop me from getting it. Um, and so when I want a canine, I was going to make sure I was in the best shape. I actually had a sports hernia at the time. And there's a physical test that you have to go through. Like you have to sprint, you have to carry a dog. Um, you have to do all these things. And it was, I didn't care that I had this tear in my abdomen. I was just like, I'm going to complete this and I'm going to be the best. And I'm going to leave you no choice, but to pick me. Um, the, we had to do like, you had to get a recommendation from a supervisor. I got recommendations from every supervisor that I'd ever worked for. Um, we were supposed to turn in just like a, a piece of paper. I turned in this like laminated packet of information. <laughs> I knew every case law. I knew the, like the policy front to back. It was one of those that if I'm going to do it and I want it, I will not be stopped. And so that's the attitude that I took into it and I got the dog. So that was, I was very happy. 
film. Did it, did any of your success have to do with the fact is that you put camo paint on, low crawled up to the other guys testing for the dog and said, look, <laughs> back off? <laughs> no, I so I love competition and I really like good competition. So it's one of those that if you try, I'm going to try harder. So I, I thoroughly enjoy when people give their absolute all. And if I get beat at something, it's it's not because I didn't try hard. It's because that other guy did something that I wasn't willing to do, and I learned from it. Yep. You know, iron sharpens 100%. iron. You want to you want to go up against the best because the best makes you even better. So yep. So and I love you that. get you get the spot. When was that? What you remember? What year that was? Oh, uh, let's see. It was uh, 2011, 12, I believe, somewhere in there. So who was your first dog? Nico. He was a retread dog. Um, he, the prior handler, who was a really a great guy, but made a bad mistake. Uh, a bad, not a bad legal mistake, a bad moral mistake, and it kind of led into a place of embarrassment and, re- and resignation. Um, and so I ended up with his dog, and I, I have the res- all the respect in the world for that guy. Um, the dog was kind of a jerk, though. <laughs> the, it, it, Nico, what kind of dog was Miko? German Shepherd. And um, I, I remember the first school and going up there and this uncertainty. I was I was just talking about this. We have a new handler that's going through a course right now. And, you know, I've been through quite a few courses now um, and taught some courses. And they're fun. But I remember the first time I saw Nico, he, they're like, go give him a bath. And I'm like, that dog will kill me. Like, what do you, <laughs> what? <laughs> they're like, no, go give it a bath. And I'm like, Oh, and there's terror and uncertainty and wonder. And it was just the coolest experience in the world. Um, I went through another kind of paramilitary. Well, hold on a second. Let me ask you about the bath thing before you get too far down. Did they, was it because was the bath designed to create some kind of bond between you or were they just screwing with you? Say, give the dog a bath like they do with rookies in the air force or Navy. Go get me a bucket of prop wash or blinker fluid. Yeah, no, it was kind of a, a both is they wanted me to get comfortable with interacting with the dog, but at the same time, it's not a good way to develop a bond uh, is to give yeah, a the dog first a bath. thing you do is you give them a bath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a horrible idea. Uh, but you know, I'm sure they could see some apprehension in me and, um, and realizing that I need to learn how to interact with this dog. And one of the biggest things that you need when you interact with a dog is confidence. And if you don't have the confidence and this is what it taught me is if you don't have the confidence, then that dog's going to tear you apart. He didn't tear me apart, but I had to learn how to approach and, and work with Nico. Talk about though the difference because you've gotten a dog later, which was fresh, you know, basically out of the out of the crate. I mean, you got the brand new dog. What's the what's the challenge of working? You called it a retread, but what's the challenge of now working with somebody else's dog, and now you've got them for the first time? Because I mean, they obviously developed their habits and their routines, and now you're you're the interloper. You're the new guy coming in. Um, what what are, what's some big challenges when you deal with a dog that had previously been assigned to someone else? Yeah, you don't know what that dog has learned. You don't know um, how it's been trained, the damage that's been done. Um, it, not it, And when I say damage, it's just one of those things that I, I do things a certain way, and I'm consistently doing it with my dog. And if someone new comes in and the dog doesn't understand that and I'm trying to do it, there might be some sort of conflict. And so it's just one of those is figuring out all the conflict. And you basically have – you have a uh, – a puzzle that you have to put together and with a green dog, you kind of know where you're starting from. Um, with a dog that's already had another handler, there's pieces that you're just not sure where they fit. And so you're trying to, you're trying to work through the process. It's, it's fascinating. I absolutely love it. Um, but it was, it was an interesting, until the end of his career with Nico, like we, we learned for instance, that he was trained in, like I trained him in German and then I, I realized like about halfway through, he was actually cha- trained in Czech. So now I had a like a polyglot dog because I he could he could respond to commands in English, uh, Czech, German. Like there's one other language, like some Spanish. Like it was just one of those that was like, oh wow! If I had done it this way, it would have been so much easier. Did yeah. you get rid of that dog? Uh, do you call it a canceled check? <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, ah, okay, thank you. That thank you. Right thank you very much. Head, folks. He did not know that I was going to say that. That is impressive. <laughs> 
I'll be here all day. I'll be here all week. <laughs> Mark, don't feed that. Don't feed that, man. It gets worse. I'm telling you. <laughs> oh my God. I just now. Okay. For our drinking game. Okay. I digress. Now back to our regularly scheduled podcast. So, um, Bam. with, with yeah. Nico, I, I, I said Nico earlier, but it's Nico N I K O. Correct. Between Nico and Mattis, at some point you met this uh, whirlwind uh, we call Christy Schiller. Yeah. When did yeah. you meet? When did you meet Christy? I had heard about Christy and the work that she did with Canines for Cops. Um, it just kind of as I grew in the canine world and um, made more connections and and met people. I think it was when I was in my trainer school with Jeff Franklin. He had some connection with Christy, and so I started hearing about her. Um, it might, yeah. And then after that, I went to, to select Mattis. Um, I, uh, went to AM canine and met with a guy, amazing decoy, great trainer, Cody talent, and he knew Christy. And so it was just all these connections of people that know and respect what she did, um, was kind of how we first crossed paths. And I think as I grew on social media too, that was one of the, that, you know, took notice of of what we were doing and somehow we, we crossed paths. You said the word decoy. What does that mean? Yeah. yeah. You said it was a great decoy. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Decoy is the person who puts on the bike suit, right? Is the person who. Oh, I thought that was the fool. (laughs) Yeah. Well, no, that too. Well, and that's one of the things in the, like, if you look in the police world, a lot of times um, what we do is we put the newest person in the, in the bite suit and say, all right, go work this dog. And it's really one of the most intense training moments that you can you can teach a dog so much of how you want them to fight and good good things to do while you're in a fight. But you have to have someone that really knows what they're doing. And when you talk about a helper or a decoy, um, those, and Cody is fantastic. It's people that really understand um, what the dog is doing while he's on a bite and how to make it better and how to respond to pressure properly. So when I say decoy, that's what I mean as someone who knows how to fight with a dog. Oh, well, I, I will make sure that I, I had a different idea for a decoy. It's like you go chase him while the bad guy runs away, but the decoy is the one who gets bit. So um, yes, pro sir. tip for you people out there, don't be a decoy. That means you're going to get bit. <laughs> yeah. Hey, and, and for right. our listeners that have not heard Christy's interview, check out episode 43 on Game of Crimes. Yep. We had her on true, uh, in my opinion, true American patriot true lover of law enforcement and especially true lover of animals and dogs and children and doing the right thing. And Murph, she is so much like this dude we're talking to right now because Christy wasn't going to be stopped either. She got an idea in her head. She goes, we're going to get some dogs. We're going to, we're going to even things up. So, I mean, you can see again, that whole thing, iron shopping's iron. So, uh, but Mark, so, but your first dog, how long did you have, uh, Nico? Um, and what happened with Nico? Why did you move on to your next dog? Yeah, he, I had it for about two years, and uh, we were on a track one time. There was a domestic violence situation, and um, and I had noticed some things with him uh, that were concerning, but we were on a track. He had a very glossy – I think it was his left eye. Um, it was – it glowed all the time, and so I was like, man, I wonder if there's something wrong with his eye, and they're like, oh, no, nothing's wrong with his eye. Uh, we were on a track for this domestic violence. A former armor ra- army ranger, I think, had um, yeah gotten w- whatever happened at home. It led to some bad stuff that happened that night. Um, and he ran from the apartment complex. We were tracking. We tracked into this bathroom, and there was a stall on the left. And and Nico just passed right by the stall. Right. And then does a circle and comes back to the stall. And there he is as I'm passing because I'm holding the leash behind him. I look over and I see him right there. And it was one of those that because he was blind in his left eye, he totally he missed just, it. He, he walked right past, which could have gotten me killed, could have gotten him killed. Um, the guy was, you know, just crying in the corner and realized he had done some bad stuff. But uh, and there was no issue. But it was one of those that I realized, man, this it's not safe for this dog. It's not safe for me. Uh, probably need to go and retire this dog. Wow, that, and, and that's probably that's probably not an easy decision to make because of, the, of no. the bond between you two guys, no. as well as the financial investment in, uh, that the department has incurred. Right? Yeah, correct. And, and credit to my department for realizing it's you know, and they are so much more than just a piece of equipment. But for them realizing that it's best for the dog, it's best for me. 
um, that we don't want to get the dog hurt. We want to make sure that you have the best uh, tools to be able to do the job. So let's go ahead and retire him. And then I had how it works is if a dog retires, the handler has the first right to the dog. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't keep Nico because of my new dog that was coming in, Mattis. They didn't get along. And so I had to find a place for him. And I found, look, I have a trainer friend and Nico in his retirement became a stud dog, which was a pretty good retirement for, for him. You know, that's not a bad way to go out. That's, that's my goal <laughs> in life. <laughs> Retire me to a farm with a lot of uh, dogs. No, uh, what, what, that, but that's good that you that take care of it because, but real quickly talk about the two Murph hit upon that, but it's one thing to realize you have to do it, but how does it affect you emotionally when you've invested so much time effort into that dog and now you got to let him go? Yeah, it was, it was hard. Um, it was a sh two years. Wasn't a terribly long time. So it made it a tad easier, but like I can speak, if you fast forward to Mattis, who I have an incredible bond with um, there, especially, and I'm sure we'll get to it later, but um when you go from having a dog to not having a dog, that is a huge jump. That's, that's a tough one. Um, with a new dog coming in, it kind of, there's a little bit of, okay, there's, there's something different. There's something new that's coming along. I won't have what I did with, with Nico, but it'll be something and we'll, we'll figure it out. So there's a little bit of hope, but it is, it's, I, I remember, you know, you get very emotionally attached. Good part of it was that he wasn't really going too far and I got to see him. Uh, every once in a while. So that wasn't too bad. How did you go about picking out Mattis then? What's the process now for getting a new dog? Well, I had been through a trainer school. So typically um, some, some schools will assign you a dog, but I was, I was one where I've been through a trainer school and how to select dogs. And so I wanted to make sure that I selected the dog for, for me, cause I knew exactly what I wanted. I thought um, I had. Now, do you select the dog or does the dog select you? Uh, it's kind of a both. Like with Mattis, it was very much, there was no other choice. Like, and he was not, like I said, kind of was because I, the trainer school that I went to this, Jeff had this amazing, probably 65, 70 pound female Mal that was Malinois, Belgian Malinois, um, was incredible. Like, and I was like, that's exactly what I want is I want to, cause I'm a small guy. Um, I'm like, I want a 65 pound, 75 pound pocket rocket, Belgian Malinois. Um, and we'll just go nuts. And then Mattis is a hundred pound German shepherd. And it was one of those that I started putting them through tests where like you take a ball and you throw it, you see how hard they go after it. You take a ball and you throw it in a high grass and see how hard they'll hunt for it. You take a ball and you put it under like a, something that they, they can't get to it, like a crate or something like that. They can see it, they can smell it but they can't get to it. How hard will they try to get to it? Um, and Mattis is like flipping things over and gets the ball anyway. Like you do all these tests and I put on the bite suit um, and you let all these dogs bite you. And then I get in with Mattis and he absolutely crushes me to the point where I can't open my hand. I'm like, I, I, I want this dog. And the, and the greatest thing about him was like, you had all these other dogs that are just nuts on the end of the leash. They're going crazy. They're like, you know, just a chainsaw. And Mattis comes in and he's just, cool, calm and collected, but will absolutely destroy anything that you ask him to. Right. He's just yeah. like, what's up? <laughs> Damn, I want one. I want one. That sounds like yeah. what General Mattis said one time. He says, yes. be calm, be cool, be well, be kind, be courteous, but have a plan to kill everybody in the room. Correct. Correct. That's the, yep. the ones I worry about too, by the way, too, you know, you talked about a ranger. We had a special, we had a domestic, almost similar, but no dogs, but me and another officer were out one time and it's like, this guy had that you run into guys like that. They have that thousand yard stare. They don't say mm -hmm. anything. They don't boast. They just have that thousand yard stare and you turn around and you go, Oh shit. We tried using a baton and stuff. And my baton just bounced off this guy. Yeah. <laughs> he, he looked at us and he finally went, guys, this can go bad for all of us. He says, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do. And he turned around and he just put his hands behind his back and we were nice. both going, Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Yeah, we did not want to fight this guy. He looks around and says, that, don't do that again. Yeah. And that's a guy that he, regardless that you were the one with the authority, he was in control the entire time. Yep. <laughs> that's, how, that's how my dog is. <laughs> that's how my wife is too. Uh, I think I'm in charge, but I'm not, uh, you know, 
so Mark, we were talking to a couple cases we want to cover, and one of them was the first time you get the dog out, the first time you get to do a track, because there's a difference, like you say, between being a narcotics dog, you know, and passive, you know, you sit down, but tracking is a very, very uh, active adrenaline, you know, you got, you got to be on, on point, you know, all the time. So t- tell us about the, the first time you did a track. Yeah, it was one. And like you said, narcotics, you get the immediate payoff, right? As you can, the drugs are either there or they're not there. Um, tracking is one where you don't always know the answer, right? As you're following this dog and sometimes it can be miles at a time and you're having to read the dog's behaviors to try to figure out whether or not he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. And um, this one was, it was kind of one that I had just gotten a new toy with Mattis and I was so impressed with the things that he could do. And there was this, basically a vehicle that had stolen some stuff from the mall. It wasn't even that big of a, not a vehicle, two people that had stolen some stuff from the mall, jumped in a vehicle, fled down the, uh, the interstate. Yeah, but you don't care at this point. It could have been a shoplifting of a piece of bubble gum. You're going yeah. like, I got my dog. We're, we're, we're going 10, eight, let's go. Right. And, but I kind of showed up on scene after the car had wrecked and they didn't even pursue it. It's just the person lost control. And, um, and they showed up on scene and it's like, Hey, that's the vehicle. And they're like, we think they ran that way. And I showed up on scene. I talked to the sergeant. I'm like, hey, I can give it a shot if you want. It was a rainy day. Um, and he was like, why would you want to? And I'm like, I don't want to. Like, okay, I, I don't – like a lot of police officers, they say you're never, you never get wet and you never go hungry, right? Those are the two rules of police officering. Cold, wet. Don't get cold, wet, or hungry. Yeah, well, I live in Georgia, so the cold's really not there. there so yeah, <laughs> we, we left that part out. <laughs> I I guess the Marine Corps in me, I, I don't mind being wet. I don't mind being muddy. I'm like, let's go. And so, and especially being canine, it's like, oh, yeah. So I, I said, hey, Sarge, I know it's not that big of a deal, but I can I can try to track him if you want. He's like, okay, go ahead. And so I get a guy in, as my backup who was Vincent Tarantonio, amazing guy, just left our police department last year. Uh, did you for, say, what did you say, Quentin Tarantino? No, <laughs> Vincent Tarantino. It's Tar- Tarantino. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Vinny. We called him Vinny. 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 Yeah. All Vinny. right, Vinny. Yeah. He just left our department. He was just he was a good cop and a good friend of mine. He stayed with me on a track, which was not many people can actually do. Uh it's hard to when you're tracking through the mud and the muck to keep up, but he did. Um and so we start tracking from the side of uh the interstate and we're going down the side of the interstate. I'm like, oh, this is you know, it's not bad. It's some a little bit of high grass, cars flying by, and then Mattis takes a left into a ditch that goes underneath all of 400, the interstate that we, you know, so he goes under this. And it's probably 400 is, let's see, four lanes each direction, so eight lanes wide. So it was a pretty long ditch that we had to go through, and it was just below my head level, so probably like <laughs> like four feet. So you had to like hunch. And I kept hitting. It was dark. There was rats. It was wet. Um, I remember, like, we're going through this tunnel that Madison pulled me through. I'm, I'm knocking my head, and I'm bald. So I have cuts on the back of my head. I'm bleeding. I'm getting wet. My back hurts. Um, we get to the edge of the tunnel, and I am, like, I'm, I'm worn out already. And it's probably, like, just a, you know, tenth of a mile, quarter mile into the track or so. Um and at the edge of the of the ditch that goes under 400, it, there's this huge drop off, probably about 20 feet, and it's all muddy and nasty, and things are coming down, and you can kind of climb up to the right. And I'm like, okay, we got to figure out what we're going to do here. Um, maybe he lost it. Maybe this wasn't a good track. And then I look to the right, up on the right, and there's a shoe stuck in the mud. And I'm like. I guess he's right. Okay. So I lift my dog (laughs) up. Gotta be him. Yep. I lift my dog up over there, try not to fall off this uh, little waterfall that they got going on. I get up there and we start tracking again and we're going through thick woods, like down this steep hill. And Mattis is kind of, he's fun too. Like the way he tracks is a lot of times you want a, a dog to be slow and methodical. He tracks best when he's running. And so it was one I remember training him in school and I tried to slow him down and he would lose odor that way. And it was, if you let him go the speed that he wants to go, he will not lose it. And so the speed that he wants to go is fast. 
He's a hundred pounds. Wow. He's strong. We're going downhill and he is flying. <laughs> and so I'm getting like hit in the head with branches and, you know, sticks in the face. I'm falling down. I'm completely covered in mud. Um, just getting worn out. He goes down this hill into a Creek and he's like, it's probably like ankle to knee deep through the Creek. We're going through just getting trashed. I'm like, there is no way this dog is still on it, but he's just, he's just like, he's wearing me out. It's not giving up. Yeah. And we start going up yeah. a hill, same thing, just full speed. I'm like holding up. He's dragging me up the hill and I am, we're about a mile into this track and I am just dead. And I'm like, I, I have to tell my dog to lay down because I, I'm, I, I need a rest and I'm bleeding from the head and all these other things. And I'm like, I, I wonder if he's still Good on thing it. It wasn't any place vital. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and so I have him laying down and he starts like creeping and I'm like, why are you cre-? like, what are you doing? And he starts creeping to the right, creeping to the right as he's laying down and his head is pulling and he's sniffing. And I, I want to quit right now. Like I, I'm ready to give up and just say, oh, okay, it's not worth it. You know, they, they shoplifted some batter. I don't even know what it was. I was just like, I don't. A shoplifter. <laughs> I'm tired. I want to go home. Um, yeah. There's another shoe. Like there's another shoe stuck in the mud right there where I have him lay down. And that's what he was sniffing and pulling to. And I'm like, I guess we're still going. Um, and so we start again, just going through it a little bit flatter ground. We're coming up to uh, the Chattahoochee river and um, all the, oh, yeah. I'm like, Did you go way down river. yonder on the Chattahoochee? <laughs> no, where it gets hotter than a hoochie coochie. Hoochie coochie. Sir. That is correct. Yeah. Um, and I'm that's where we were. <laughs> uh, he takes a right and once, like I'm trying to figure out where exactly we are so I can let dispatch know where we are. Cause we're like in the woods by the Chattahoochee is all I know. Um, and so I'm kind of looking for a street. Well, that certainly a... narrows it down, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's a street over to my left and I'm kind of looking at that. And then Mattis almost rips my arm off just pulling. And, I, and so like I, I go towards him and, uh, there in the distance, probably about, you know, 500 yards in front of me in the woods, I see two people that just are wide eyed, like, Oh my goodness. How did you find us? Right. <laughs> And so <laughs> the Terminators have, but there's a, a fence in between where we are and they are. And so I'm running toward, and it, remember it's a shoplifting. So it's not one that I can, I'm not telling my dog to go bite them at all. Um, it's, but there's a fence. And so they start running. Mattis just, it's probably a four and a half foot fence, just clears the fence. And here I come just boom, straight into the fence face first. <laughs> and so I, I, I flip myself over the fence finally um just and they're like they saw that and they're like okay we give up and uh but it was man you guys was, take shoplifting <laughs> seriously in alpharetta <laughs> <right>. georgia <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a peaceful well, outcome yeah go ahead what's what's vinny's remarks after all this big chase i, I turned to him and i said bro amazing job because like literally it doesn't matter on a track typically your your backup gets lost in the woods and he was with me the entire time so he was like man, that dog's good. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> I, I'm really impressed. Hey, players, that is the end of part one. Part two, as always, comes out on Thursday. In the meantime, check us out at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook, at the Instagram. But where you got to be, where you got to be, where you got to be, got to be on Patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. We have a ton of good stuff, including if you are at the right level, Guardian of the Realm and Warden of the Throne, we have just released part one, episode one of the real DEA Narcos talking about the real DEA Narcos, Cali edition, Chris Feistel and Dave Mitchell go in-depth 16 hours about how they took down the Cali cartel. Information you will not hear anywhere else in the world, not on Netflix, not anywhere, not in a book, only right here on Game of Crimes at patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. In the meantime, also go check out our webpage, gameofcrimespodcast.com. We've got the latest merch, pictures for every episode that we put up, books that our guests write. We only put up books that they write. We put them up there. So we thank you once again for being a player in the biggest, baddest, most dangerous game of all, the... Game of Crimes.